that he published called Is the First Amendment Obsolete that Jamil referenced uh, for the Knight Institute. Um, so, so Tim, the, the premise uh, and the kind of descriptive thrust of that paper is that a variety of the First Amendment's canonical assumptions right. have become outdated in light of new developments, right. um, rendering the whole legal edifice obsolete. So can you just walk us through what has gotten us to this place? Sure, no, I'd be pleased to. I don't want to spend forever on thanks, but I do owe a lot, uh, both Brown, but especially the Knight First Amendment Institute, uh, for uh, provoking me to think about these things. You know, I wrote an essay, I was like, here's some, some strange ideas I'm having, and, 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 uh, they've, and David edited them, so that's why he <laughs> called it exquisite editing. So I just want to put that out. But you know, to answer this question, the First Amendment, uh, is what I think most Americans, many people in this room, sort of think of as the, of the bulwark, the, the protection of, of, and the guarantor of, of America's uh, speech environment. And in sort of a model, maybe not for the whole world, but it is one of the earliest of its kind. Um, but I want to suggest that many of its operating assumptions have become obsolete. And I think this has a lot to do with uh, a timing and technological change. Uh, the First Amendment was, uh, although obviously in the Bill of Rights, really came to life during the 19, late 1910s and, er, and 1920s uh, in an era where the speech environment and speech technologies were profoundly different than today, I think almost obviously. And uh, I want to focus particularly on, on three uh, changes uh, f that have, have re rendered uh, some of the core ideas, uh, what I say, uh, obsolete. I should say as a caveat, I don't mean to say that the First Amendment's useless. I don't think that uh, government censorship is not a problem. I just think for some of our problems today in a uh, the speech environment we face, uh, that these operating assumptions are, are obsolete. So here are the, the, the big three I want to discuss. Uh, the first, uh, is that the First Amendment's jurisprudence was conceived in a time when speaking was very expensive. Public speaking was very expensive. You had to own a radio station or a printing press or, or be able to mail to, to huge numbers of people. And that has obviously changed completely. You know, we live in a so-called era of cheap speech. Um, it's not hard to have a Twitter account. And if that's not good enough, you can employ a thousand robots to do your speaking for you. It, it's, uh, most people in our daily lives feel, feel overwhelmed. A second, and this is related, uh, uh, David had mentioned my book, uh, to the, the issue of attention. We live in, uh, back in, in the early 20th century, it was presumed that speakers would be few and that uh, listeners would have sort of abundant time and energy to consider any idea that, that got out there. I think this situation has reversed rather dramatically, uh, that listener attention has become extremely scarce, and there's a, a dramatic, uh, almost vicious competition for every uh, waking moment. We have, uh, maybe to our detriment, we have conquered the problem of boredom, but have, <laughs> have become inflicted with different problems, one of which, and, and you'll maybe talk about this more, is that there's really intense competition uh, for even a second of people's time. And uh, the third operating assumption, one very important to the troll army theme, is the sense that government is the principal or maybe the only threat to f free speech. And as long as government were to stay out of the way, the marketplace of ideas will take care of, of itself. Um, you know, I think in the 1920s, there were considerable reasons to, to focus on government uh, in the First World War the critics of the war, even in the Woodrow Wilson administration, which some people think of as, well, I mean, it was democratic and maybe friendly in some ways, arrested the people who dared question the war effort through a leading presidential candidate in, in prison, uh, Eugene Debs. Um, and from that uh, experience, the First Amendment was conceived as if the uh, speakers were these sort of rare butterflies being threatened by one giant monster, namely, namely the government. I think today we have a very dramatically different uh, situation. I'm not saying government is irrelevant, but many of the most profound challenges to speak and speakers are undertaken by, by private parties. Um, one thing maybe you'll discuss, the, the title of this is the, the sense that some speakers are punished 
severely by tr private troll armies which uh, descend upon people who dare, uh, for example, criticize uh, the president. Um, another aspect is that the major speech platforms have enormous power over what gets heard and what doesn't get heard. In some ways the government, while not irrelevant, is often a bit player in determining the speech environment in a way they were clearly not in the 1920s. So these are, these are big changes and uh, you know, in the paper I discuss more whether the First Amendment uh, can adjust to it, but I think it is almost uh, beyond the powers of the First Amendment. I think it takes a full discussion and we're beginning that discussion as to whether something can be done about the speech environment in the United States. I take, I don't want to go on forever on this, but you know, I take a, a view that governance is, is challenging, collective governance is challenging, associated with Michael Johnian view, and, and in some ways a function, a functional, uh, you know, a, a, a challenging functional um, a social project, and that we need a functioning speech, speech environment uh, to guarantee good governance. So that, that's my introduction, okay. and uh, thank great. you very much. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So let's, let's get to sol possible solutions um, later on, but maybe first try to get yeah. on, the, on the massive table here. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, a little bit more texture on the nature of, of the, these emerging problems. Um, so one big theme in your paper, Tim, is the, mm -hmm. the kind of weaponization of speech, and this can take the form of uh, troll armies that mm -hmm. mobilize to harass a disfavored speaker, um, you could think of fake news in these terms, yeah. um, flooding, so-called flooding tactics. Um, yeah. And Julia, you have written some recently about uh, troll armies and their you know, tentacles and uh, uh, email bombing and kind of related phenomena. Um, maybe I invite you to respond to anything you heard from Tim, but also just talk about the experience uh, as a prominent public intellectual of some of these uh, phenomena. Sure. Um, no, um, I think that the troll armies, you know, are really people have experienced, ex a lot of people experience them actually. You don't actually, what's so weird about our speech environment is that you don't even have to be <laughs> particularly famous to be attacked by, by trolls. Um, but, you know, I think that um, the experience that my colleagues and I, one of my colleagues, Lauren, is here, and we wrote a story um, in August about how, uh, we just basically looked at the top um, hate sites as categorized by the Southern Poverty Law Center or ADL and saw what kind of technology platforms were enabling them. And the story we wrote was like, you know, it looks like PayPal enabling a lot of donations to these hate sites and, a and other companies too, but they were the largest. And um, as a result, some of the sites that uh, we wrote about got, were extremely angry and basically it seems that they were the instigators of sort of a hate attack on me and my colleagues. And what happened was sort of, it was like interesting how it happened in waves. So at first, basically, Lauren got a specific emails just to her uh, about saying terrible things. You know, people should throw acid in your face, you should be raped, terrible things. Then um, all of the people who were on the story, which was three bylines, were um, actually got this thing called an email bomb, which I had never heard of. Has anyone heard of an email bomb? No, okay, let me tell you what it is because it may happen to you one day. <laughs> so basically any website that has an email sign up form, sign up for my like daily newsletters from Costco or from the New York Times or whatever, mm -hmm. um, somebody puts your name into every right. one of those using some sort of automated bot. I mean, they might be doing it by hand, but it seems extremely unlikely. And um, this service, by the way, Paul, is uh, available for um, $5 her email address on like the dark net, you know, hacker forums. So it's the cheapest possible attack. And then you're flooded, your email box is flooded with confirmation emails. So it's not that you, you it's just that constant thing like confirm that you signed up for this email. And this actually was so intense, this number of signups, that um, our organization's email system collapsed. <laughs> so it was, a, you know, for $5, that was a pretty effective attack. Right. Um, so they had to shut off um, our effective email addresses and we had no email for a week while, um, because the influx was so large. So that was the beginning. And then what happened was we got a Twitter attack. So we got nicely like all the different pieces. <laughs> and so um, what we noticed was both Lauren and Jeff, my other colleague, tweeted about the email attack and then each one of those tweets got like 20,000 retweets. 
And we were confused at first. We were like, this is a attack where they're making us look more popular <laughs> than we are, which is strange. And then we all got an influx of new followers. But we we then, the, but then it really began, which was that it started sending hateful messages about us, and then ret those got 20,000 retweets. And what I learned was that sometimes this can be an effort to get you thrown off Twitter, because if you have a lot of bots following you, it's assumed you bought them, and that you're the one causing the bad behavior. And so another um, reporter, actually, that same week had I'd been thrown off um, Twitter because the bots had done this tricky thing where they followed him and they made it seem like he was a bad actor. So the the attacks are all very strange and weird. So we went and looked, by the way, to see how much it costs to do a Twitter bot attack. So we bought our own bots just for fun. And it is actually more expensive than the email bombing. bombing. It was, I think, like, we spent about $100 and we got about 50,000 retweets. So, um, you know, cost benefit, I guess I would go with the email bombing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think the larger point is that, you know, this is a decentralized communications network and it has really great advantages. You know, there's a lot of things that uh, uh, the internet mm -hmm. enables that are wonderful, but it is extremely hard to secure the borders. You know, I mean, basically right. there's ha ha getting every email list in on the web to put in a CAPTCHA to determine that it's a bot versus a human. That's a, like a big ask. And so it's not clear how you can prevent these attacks. And so it's one of this classic asymmetrical warfare where right. the cost of attack is cheap and the cost of defense is extremely high. So yeah. it seems to me in, in your story, there's also an interesting wrinkle, which is uh, the very policy Twitter has adopted to try to prevent misuse of its service by bots is, is itself being weaponized uh, because you're being associated with bots in an attempt to get you kicked off. Yeah. Um, but that speaks to a larger issue of how uh, social media platforms like Twitter are responding to all of this. So um, could, could you both maybe say a little bit about, in your experience, how you found Twitter uh, and Facebook? Uh, I mean, um, there's this trend that ha is consistent on both platforms that the victims get re-victimized, actually. So mm -hmm. what happens um, on Facebook more than Twitter is Facebook users, somebody will say something terrible to them and they screenshot it and put it in there to show people, look what somebody said to me, and then they get kicked off and not the original person. And this is a consistent thing that um, constantly is being reported about right. on right. Facebook. And Facebook has said they're trying to do better on that and a whole range of other topics they're trying to do better on as well. But um, so that's one thing that happens. And then the Twitter thing is a little different because actually uh, they do, um, it's not clear what they're doing because they there's these companies that buy and sell bots and they're advertising them in the clear and this supposedly breaks the terms of service and so I'm not sure what Twitter is doing to police that. I mean, it seems like not that much. <laughs> we bought them in Yeah, I think not that much. I think not that much. Uh, can I say a little bit about the yeah, origins of, of some of these yeah. techniques? Uh, so one of the things I, I did, and I didn't do the original research, but I read the research by the very capable uh, people who've been interested in the, the weaponization of speech. And I hope we can see why that's such a challenge for our First Amendment conception where sort of basic premise is more speech always, always better. But what happens when, as you're talking about, all these things are using speech as, as a weapon of censorship. So it's like confusing for a you know, for country who uh, likes speech. So um, the, the researchers suggest that m uh, many of these techniques developed in some of the more sensorial countries in the world, uh, Russia and China in particular. Uh, you know, these were countries that um, are very interested in control of speech. Uh, obviously saw the, the internet as a challenge. Um, traditional uh, tools of censorship are somewhat effective, but often less effective. Um, uh, China in particular uh, took the policy that sometimes outright censorship would create more publicity for the speaker sometimes, and so could sometimes backfire. So you see the development of, of the techniques we, we're, we're talking about. Uh, in, in Russia, in the early, uh, around the Ukraine crisis and so forth, um, you see the development of a, 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 a web brigade, a, a funded uh, group of uh, people who study the techniques for best uh, harassing or humiliating or making difficult the lives of journalists who criticize the state. And, and they start inside Russia. And, you know, and the idea is to, to chill. I mean, at least put that moment, you were like, even while you're writing, telling that story, I was like, huh, how would I feel about writing a story about a 
far-right group when I got to think, well, it's very courageous, but then I'm going to be like cleaning up the mess for months. Maybe I'll write about something else. You know, I mean, a lot of people, they were even, you're brave to, to be doing this. Um, uh, so so that, that was the idea to humiliate uh, and come up with all the techniques, which are basically, you know, various versions of hacker techniques. These are kind of all variants on something that in computer science you call denial of service tax, uh, except for they're directed at humans. And in China in particular, um, you see more of the development of the, the flooding techniques. You see some of this in Turkey as well, where as opposed to trying to censor, you just f you know, flood the world with, with different kinds of news, happy news. Uh, China has, you know, pays, uh, they have this 50 cent army, apparently millions of people to just sort of be on, on board, say positive things, you know, take the party line, talk about how great China is, and sort of just drown everything out. So these are techniques, um, I think, that have really come to the United States in the last year or two. And I, I think even within the last year or two, there's been a transformation in our speech environment. And that's I think the, the you know, trajectory you have to understand here. Let me introduce uh, another element of, of uh, concern about how our uh, digital speech environment is getting disrupted or um, undermined. And that's um, hate speech. And that's implicated, too, in, in, in your story and your reporting. Um, uh, but can exist separately from drowning and flooding and troll armies. Um, uh, I know you've done some reporting as well, Julia, and you're working on something big now on how services like Facebook handle hate speech. I wonder if you could say a little about what you're what you're finding. These are these are rules, unlike laws the government will prom would, you know would promulgate that are largely non-public. But I gather you've been yeah. figuring it out. So in June. Um we published some leaked documents um, showing sort of Facebook's secret hate speech rules. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting about them is that, you know, this is, they've just created their own basically legal system which governs the speech of two billion people who use the platform. And it, they had, uh, you know, I think borrowed from, um, there are some hate speech rules in Europe that they sort of, it seemed to lean on, but it was its own unique animal. and the. Seven, they had seven types of protected categories of people. So basically, you're only protected against hate speech if it was directed at you because of your race, religion, gender, a few other pretty mm -hmm. obvious characteristics. And there are only seven <coughs> types of attacks that are considered hate speech, so slurs, dismissal, dehumanization, calls for violence, things like that. So they have these seven and seven, and they like match them, and they have all these human moderators sitting in like the Philippines, some data center, and they have to look at like you know, thousands of them a day and decide if they meet this criteria. But what was weird about their rules is that they missed some really obvious things. So the slide that we had, these training slides, where they train the people who are sitting in these mm -hmm. data centers. And so there's a slide that said, <coughs> which of these three categories is protected against hate speech? And it was a picture of a woman next to a car, female drivers, a picture of two black kids, so black children, and then the picture of some white men and said white men. And the correct answer to who was protected against hate speech on this slide was white men. And the reason was that they have this strange rule about subgroups. So essentially, if you put a modifier next to one of the protected mm -hmm. categories, so it's a subgroup of children or drivers, you're suddenly like negated and the, and the hate speech <laughs> the rules don't apply. It's fair game. Wait, I don't, what, what, I, somehow I don't get it. Or is it, is it not gettable? It's not gettable, I think. It's I just, see. whenever you, yeah, uh, they decided that subsets of protected categories are not protected categories. That's just a decision that they made. And their okay. legal regime, which has not been inspected by anyone, right? Uh -huh. And so it's one of these things that's really interesting because this is just a bunch of people at Facebook yeah. with moderately good intentions, but they are trying to write an algorithm for all these people, and they've come up with their own kind of structure. And then if we hadn't seen these documents, no one would even know right, whether mm -hmm. what these rules are about. And it somewhat explains some of the mysteries of people who report hate speech are constantly saying, you know, so weird, this thing got deleted, but that didn't. What I'm doing now is, since then, we've been running a crowdsourcing project to ask people on Facebook about how accurately these rules are applied. Because the other thing that we heard after the story came out was, well, actually, those rules say this, but in fact, my thing got taken down yeah. that doesn't even. So now what we're exploring, and the results hopefully will be coming out soon, is whether they're even following their own rules, which is its own separate question. Right. But both of them speak to this idea that they've built this, own, this legal regime that polices speech, that has no recourse. People can't appeal their, the decisions, and operates entirely outside of the realm of the First right. Amendment. 
So, right. on the, so here I feel obliged to interject as the constitutional law uh, professor uh -huh. in the group that, um, as you may know, U.S. First Amendment law is far more protective of hate speech than that of almost any other country. Um, in many contexts, your hate speech has to amount to imminent, as in very, very immediate incitement to physical violence, um, or else it's protected. So a lot of these hateful slurs you're describing um, would actually be protected from uh, prosecution uh, or censorship under the First Amendment if a, a, a government actor were trying to do that prosecution or censorship. So interesting, fascinatingly, Facebook, uh, Julia's reporting, I think is suggesting, has, um, and there's been some other good work on this recently, has developed this ERTSATS um, quasi-legal regime without guidance from the First Amendment law about how to deal with these issues, and it sounds like it's making <coughs> some blunders along the way. But um, this, this does raise a difficult question, I think, right. which Tim, maybe you could speak on, which is um, I think there's an instinct among a lot of people to throw the First Amendment at problems. Right. Um, right. What that would mean, at least in the context of hate speech on a platform like Facebook, uh, is that Facebook couldn't do um, right. even crude, clumsy, but potentially getting better over time efforts at regulating a lot of hate speech. I mean, does this give you pause? Yeah, no, I think that is when the challenges get, get uh, uh, you know, when, when the questions get challenging. If you accept, as we said earlier, that you know, most speech today is heavily intermediated, uh, you know, it only is, is relevant if it's uh, on, you can have your own blog, but <laughs> sort of, you know, Facebook and Twitter and some of these other big, or even Google are the big intermediaries. And um, so how do you feel about them as, as controllers of the speech environment? What norms sh should they follow? So my own view uh, on this, I, I can see what the reflex some people would be like, oh my God, Facebook, you know, being the censor is worse than the government being the censor because at least government you can, um, you know, vote against them and, uh, and in theory replace or something like that. They're somewhat accountable. So I, I buy that argument. On the other hand, I feel if they don't do anything, you know, that's how we got to where we are. In other words, I think the sort of laissez-faire, you know, we're just a platform, we're just a tech company, we, we don't bear any responsibility, uh, don't, don't come to us complaining, uh, you know, the people are bad. I think that attitude has led to this incredible deterioration of the speech environment. Now, I should add their business model hasn't helped. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, they have a business model which, uh, particularly Facebook, is driven by sort of um, trying to hook you into powerful emotional responses so you spend more time. So delivering up the, because they're, 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 their business model fundamentally depends on how much time you spend on the site. And so, you know, there's a reason every time you're looking at Facebook, you, you feel your heart beating all the time and you're getting angry oh, at stuff. Outrage porn. Outrage porn, exactly. So, you know, there, there is that. Um, I, I, on the other hand, I think they do have public duties that go way, way, way beyond uh, even where they are right now. So this is my own view. I think they should be, you know, maybe a little more accountable, maybe a little more publicly, but they should be engaged. Uh, great power comes great responsibility. You know, in some ways, they're the CBS News of, of, our, of our time, the way CBS was, uh, in the 50s, and you know, for better or for worse, the media has, off, has felt they have some responsibility for our speech environment and have to take this, this responsibility seriously, and the, the Facebook like, all right, we're just, uh, we just run the pipes, it's just not working anymore. Is it not on? No. Oh. Oh. That's on. It's on. Am I not loud? Should I yell? Am I, am I loud? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, uh, Julie, what, what we was? Talk about yeah, what? Two thirty. Is this? Yeah, good. Why don't we go there now? The right sure. Time? Okay. <laughs> oh. Okay. Now I have to turn this on. Yeah. Okay. Am I adequately mic'd? No. <laughs> I cannot speak. My speech is being. <laughs> 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 I knew there'd be a joke like Sud that. Subtle censorship. What's happening? I don't know. Um, I think you've got like some mic thing. Okay. There we okay. Go. It's working. We're watching this. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's see, let's see what off. happens. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. I want to talk about Section 230, because that right. was just such a great tee up. We just explained what that, what that yeah, is. Yeah, so okay. anyone, who knows what Section 230 is? Okay, nobody, cool. <laughs> so basically, um, Section 230 is just a provision of the Telecom Act of 1996 that gives the- The Communications Decency Act, to be more oh, precise. Sorry, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just joking, because this has such a funny name. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so but it is, yeah, sorry. it's the Indecency Act, really, because right. it gives all the tech companies uh, immunity for liability of anything that is published by third parties on their platform. 
And so this is essentially means that the way a newspaper, where I spent most of my career, um, would be liable not just for the articles they wrote, but actually for the letters to the editor. Everything that's printed in the paper, uh, we had to take responsibility for. And so that led to a lot of careful vetting of everything. And the tech companies argued um, that they shouldn't have to be responsible for, at the time, what was really basically like comments and like user forums. Right. And, but now has expanded to this fact that they um, basically don't have to comply Amazing. with the law at all. And it is interesting because it gives them a clean slate to say, eh, whatever's happening on here doesn't matter to me. So, so yeah. uh, Tim, do you want to go? No, and I, I'll say a little bit about that law, Section 230, communicate, and it's, it's something that people are talking a, a lot about in this space. So, you know, in the 90s, uh, it, it, it's one of these things where something looks great when it's small, and then when it gets big, you're like, you know, you, you might change your mind about it, like maybe if you adopt a tiny snake and it grows into a boa constrictor <laughs> or something. Uh, so, in, 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 the, in the early 90s, you know, the, the internet was new and vulnerable. Uh, the sense was, uh, well, you know, actually, AOL uh, was one of the big advocates of this law. Oh, you know, we host thousands of uh, chat rooms, and uh, you know, the old laws of the of the 20th century aren't going to work for us because if we're liable for everything anyone says in our chat room, it's impossible for us to. You know, we're not like a newspaper. We just have a newspaper. We have like, you know, it's the whole internet, uh, or we have this massive sort of site. So, so it, uh, the arguments for it were very strong in the 90s. But as these companies gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and it's beginning increasingly to feel like this, this incredible subsidy. And I, I just want to talk about you know, just how that, that feels changes. But as you said, it does give this sort of blanket immunity to any sort of defamation claims, anything like that, and uh, you know, and, it's worth I mean, thinking honestly, about. Honestly, right now, yeah. um, it's, it's being argued. You know, I've been also writing about discriminatory advertising on Facebook, and it's actually being argued by some people but, um, that it gives the company's immunity for violating the Fair Housing Act and right. Fair Credit. Um, and so uh, I think that hasn't played out entirely in, in the courts. I don't know whether it's going to survive, but uh, it's a question, right? Whether how far does that immunity extend yeah, to civil explain, rights laws? Why don't you explain the, the, the fair housing discrimination? Because yeah. I think this is really shocking yeah, to so, me. Um, yeah, so I, sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry, we'll just do a little tangent on fair yeah. housing. It's related to speech, guys. So um, uh, last year, um, I had heard that uh, there was a way you could buy ads on Facebook that would violate the Fair Housing Act, which prevents discrimination in housing ads. So my colleagues and I went on Facebook and bought in their little automated ad buying platform. We just picked buy housing ad, we put in like housing, people looking for housing, and then they have this thing, can, you can exclude audiences from seeing your ad. So we excluded African Americans, Asian Americans, and Hispanics from viewing our ad. And it was published, um, it was approved, you know, they have some sort of automated approval system, it was approved within minutes. And um, when we called them, they're like, oh, you know, sometimes stuff happens, and, but we're <laughs> gonna build a gigantic algorithm that will spot these ads in the future. So they rolled out this machine learning system in February of this year, and then last week, I was like, I wonder if that's working. So I went in and bought the same ads, and they were sailed right through, and there was no approval process. And um, they were like, oh, I think maybe our algorithm's not working that well. Um, so just yesterday, they have decided to, uh, and at the time I said to them, guys, I don't know if you need an algorithm, like it's a drop down menu called exclude these audiences. <laughs> I, why don't you just take it out of there, you know, take out race, right. which is what we had put, you know, put right. in. And so to yesterday they said, you know, I think we're going to take race out of the drop down menu. <laughs> I was like, amazing, you guys are geniuses. But at the same time, like they are fighting in court yeah. a case on this, uh, that challenges our first ad buy. And, um, says, you know, this is a violation of the Fair Housing Act, and they're using Section 230 as one of their arguments, that right. they're not, um, you know, the immunity to that claim. Just, just to further yeah. flesh this out, the, um, you know, normally uh, an operator of a, of a premises, like Columbia University with this space, has a duty of reasonable care to people who come in the space um, that you not be subject to various types of injury or offense. And if Columbia takes no precautions and you get injured, you might be able to sue Columbia, not just the person who, you know, caused the, the injury to you more immediately. Um, that principle has not carried over to the internet uh, uh, space. In light of Section 230 immunity, um, uh, intermediaries covered under it 
don't, aren't held to a duty to prevent uh, people from posting defamatory content uh, on their site, um, posting revenge porn, which has been a big uh, flashpoint. You can't go after the uh, website that's right. hosting the revenge porn under 230, it seems. Um, uh, and, uh, and then these ads that appear to violate the Fair Housing Act. Um, the Fair Housing Act, just to, just to point out too, just how uh, this, this intersects with the technological capacity of Facebook. Um, these uh, uh, real estate brokers that want to put out ads for who can rent their apartments and may want to exclude certain racial groups, they, c they could never say in the text of their ad, no one of a certain race can apply for our apartments. That would clearly subject them to liability under the Fair Housing Act. Um, mm -hmm. But they can functionally work around that by telling Facebook, we only want our ad to be seen by uh, users from certain racial, <laughs> racial groups. Right. Uh, they achieve the same result. And Facebook, in turn, is immunized from liability for abetting that conduct. Um, under well, two, they, well, well, at least, well, we don't well, that's know if they're yeah. immunized, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I think the courts are still deciding. And the Fair Housing Act, to be clear, is extremely specific. It says you cannot publish or cause to be published an ad that's discriminatory. And so, I mean, I think there's still some possibility that the courts might say, no, you know what, that. That's true. That, that's right. an area that, that's in flux. But maybe I could pan out and just say, yeah. it seems like there are at least three different levels on which, um, if you buy that there's a problem here, whether from the combination of troll armies, flooding tactics, fake news, bots, the rise of various forms of hate speech online, right. that, that demands a solution. Then one level of solution might be the First Amendment itself. You know, the First right. Amendment itself should be interpreted to prohibit certain forms of speech conduct that we find really mm -hmm. uh, uh, deleterious. Um, this, that's the, they call it the constitutional solution. The, the second level of, of, of interaction or, or intervention might be legislative. Congress comes in and says, Twitter and Facebook, you must take action to prevent these types of ads, to clean up your act and, uh, with bots, um, as some are proposing now, or the Honest Ads Act, which is in Congress right now. Right. Um, and the third level, which, which we've already touched, is self-regulation by these right. companies. Um, so I've heard, I've heard um, notes from both of you suggesting more self-regulation is called for. Would you support solution one or two, you know, constitutional or legislative solutions as well? Is self-regulation sufficient? Do you want to go first? I mean, I'm in the business of problems and not solutions. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I can, I'm going to punt on this except to say that the evidence strongly suggests that self-regulation is not working. Right. And I, 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 I echo that. I think there's a real problem uh, with self-regulation given that the business model you know, is, is so driven in the, in the opposite direction. And, you know, I think that um, the hearings in, in, in Congress made clear there, you know, there's a strong incentive to sort of offer lip service, say a lot of things, but not, not do too much uh, to, to deal with this. By the way, since we're in the J School, I, I was thinking it's, it's interesting that you're, it's a matter of uh, journalistic technique, that basically your technique is to figure out how hard it is to do very evil things. <laughs> That's what you do. You'd like, I need to have a lot of Yeah, no, I like it. Like yeah. it's, no, it's great. You sort of go around, okay. It's sort of like imagine different kind of reporters, like, hmm, I'm going to try and break into a bunch of people's houses and see if anything happens You're or not. not. It's anything. not that bad. I'm just saying it's like you, but you don't actually do the thing. Really, you just find out how hard it well, is to I'll do. Well, I'll say this. I mean, right. I pursue journalism <laughs> in the spirit of, hacker, of a hacker. Right. And yeah, sure. I do hire uh -huh. hackers and I do have uh, two programmers who work for me and so we are technologically driven in our investigations and I think that is something honestly I just think more journalism should be that way right mm -hmm. so yeah no no great that was uh, an aside <laughs> uh, I was buying time to try and think of solutions <laughs> well, what, <what's laughs> <laughs> well let me what, what would it mean you, you suggested in your in your essay yeah. and a little bit here that um, maybe social media companies need to develop a self-conception as journalistic yes. entities. What, what would that mean and how would, how would one ever so here, enforce that? So not all media, social media platforms have these kind of problems. Um, so for example, Wikipedia is a pretty important website. It has, you know, it's, traffic is always in the top 10. It does not have a fake news problem and does not have, as far as I can tell, a hate speech problem. Sometimes there's some nasty fights in, um, you know, in discussions over whether to delete various celebrities or whatever, but that, that's a, a completely different issue. And I think structurally they set themselves up very differently. Their self-conception was from the beginning, you know, we're, we're about truth and, and so forth. And so they have extreme, uh, and in some, in some ways, you, you could use words, or extreme self-control. Snap also doesn't have uh, as many of these problems. I don't, you might know better than I as many they have. Uh, they, 
and, and I think from, from greater uh, moderation. And so I think Facebook, um, I'll go back to great power comes great responsibility. I think some of the core journalistic norms uh, should be embraced by Facebook and Facebook should self-identify itself more uh, as a site that is about community, family, and friends and not a new site unless they want to fully, I think they have a choice. They can either embrace that they're about family, friends, community, you know, what's going on in the local baseball game, or they are, you know, kind of a quasi-news site. But if they're going to be a quasi-news site, uh, and, you know, they like news because it gets people staying on Facebook and excited about it, then they need to, uh, I think, embrace core journalistic norms. And maybe the one I would start with is having a conception of what news is. So, you know, in the journalism school, um, and people in, you know, journalists often say, oh, we don't really have ethics. You were saying this earlier, we don't really have ethics. But I think journalists have one really important ethic, which is that they don't print rumors as news, generally speaking. I mean, journalists are constantly bombarded with people calling them and saying, hey, you know, did you know that so-and-so has three bastard children? Sorry, it's probably the wrong word. Illegitimate children, or do you know that so-and-so did this? And most of those stories don't get uh, printed um, because they're unsubstantiated. But Facebook has allowed the, the you know, the, the line between rumor and fact to become eroded. Twitter as well, where, you know, they, they will circulate on the same basis as real news stories, stories that are, you know, like the Pope endorsing Trump or, or things like that, which are fake or unsubstantiated or just don't fit the, the, the criteria. And I don't think, and the thing is they, they've had, tried to have it both ways. They want all the traffic and excitement of being a news site. They don't want any of the ethics. Their method is to sort of blame it. Well, the users posted it, but I think that, that that's done. So I, I think they have to make a choice and then live by those well, rules. Can I just follow up and ask yeah. you, if, if you, but since you are skeptical of their incentive ever to do so, given their business model, right. um, are you suggesting a, uh, a new statute from Congress that directs Facebook to sort fake or unsubstantiated news from real news in, 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 in a certain way? I mean, are you imagining a, a governmental mandate? That would be my fallback. My, you know, first order would be that public pressure, maybe even user pressure, uh, would generate similar results as a fallback. And I, I don't say it's because I'm some you know, crazy uh, libertarian. I, if we're given an ideal Congress, maybe the Congress of 1810, I have a slightly, or 18 whenever, I have slightly, I don't know if that was a good one. Uh, 1815, the Treaty of Ghent. I'm trying to think of a good Congress. Um, Whatever the best Congress was, I have slightly different. But let, let, assuming we have a sort of Herculean. Probably post, uh, post Civil War, yeah. Yeah, a Herculean Congress filled with, uh, I, I, you know, then, 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 yeah, I think that a law that said if you are, uh, I have some, if you are, a new, you know, if you're going to claim to be a news site, you have, I have some, I, I admit I'm a little challenged. How about I'm undecided on it? I'd have um, to see how it goes. I think I would take a different model altogether right. than journalism for these sites. I would sort of take a cybersecurity approach, which is that really the problem here is that they bear no, they pay no cost for the trauma that is inflicted by their site, right? And that's the classic cybersecurity problem, which is, uh -huh. you know, it's um, guerrilla warfare, right? So it's easy to launch attacks, it's hard to defend, right. and. Um, and so I think you have to think about incentive structures for like, well, what would make them bear more of the cost of, of this? And I do think that one thing that is simple, I mean, I'm sort of into these simple solutions of like, I'm get rid of the drop down, right? Or like, you know, don't um, have an appeals process. Like if you're going to delete hate speech and you're going to have secret rules about how you do it, public, you shouldn't have secret rules. You should publish the rules and you should be held, held accountable to them. And then that forces everyone to be a little more thoughtful when they mm. make these decisions, yeah. right? So it increases the cost on them a little bit. And also would, I think, build trust with their users who are increasingly disenchanted. So I guess I see it as an incentive structure issue, which is how you tweak these issues. But I'm also, like I said, bad at solutions. And well, so I also, <laughs> I would be remiss not to mention another solution, which is part of the problem here is the market power, monop near monopoly power yeah. of Facebook. So I'm also an antitrust professor and I'm a big believer in breakups. And I think a little competition wouldn't hurt in this area. You know, that if you had a sort of, imagine like a serious social media site that promised to be better with your privacy, promised not to carry fake news, promised to do, you might see a little more pressure, but the, the, Facebook's been very effective in eliminating its competitors or even its starting competitors and that's been a problem. Yeah, and I think it's worth pointing out, which I like to point out at all times, is that the reason journalism as 
are, is declining and suffering so badly is that um, all the money went to Google and Facebook, all of online mm. advertising revenue. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure this is all obvious to you, but I'm gonna just walk you through how this happened because I try to re remind people all the time. It used to be, I worked at the Wall Street Journal for 14 years. The reason the Wall Street Journal was successful is they sold their audience. These are white guys who like to golf and have a Mercedes, right? Like, there was a great audience and they could charge a ton for them. You go to the internet and you don't need to go on the Wall Street Journal page because you have tracking to follow those white guys everywhere they go. And in fact, they're better reached when they're sort of like, why am I on this site? Get me out of here. And they see an ad, right? Where if they're engaged with the content, they're not interested in the ad. So all the money went to the ad networks that track people all around, which have basically collapsed down to Google and Facebook. And so they have basically 90% of online ad revenues. And the two largest uh, news websites in the world are ESPN and the New York Times, and neither one of them can support um, even just their own independent website doesn't make enough money to support itself, right? So this is a collapse of a revenue structure based entirely on this new model of tracking. So you, you, know, you have to see where the problem is. The problem is that this duopoly took everything. Now, what's the right solution? You know, I'm always joking like reparations is the right solution. <laughs> now, is anyone offering that? But I feel like they should put some money in a fund and <laughs> fund journalism. Now, maybe that's not going to go anywhere. But I do think that at, that is an appropriate diagnosis of the problem. Is that Jeff Bezos buying the Washington Post? That kind of is reparations, <laughs> is I think. Reparations? <laughs> this, this, yeah, this may get us beyond scope, but um, uh, there is, I think, a lurking question here whether the collapse of the traditional economic model of investigative reporting is, in fact, the deepest threat of all, you know, in these troll army that are surface threats compared to it. <laughs> I can't help but note on your point about changing incentive structures that that does relate back to our Section 230 discussion. Um, in a world in which Section 230 were interpreted or modified uh, to give you liability, if you publish things that are false and defamatory, uh, your right. Facebook, you're going to take a lot more care. Um, uh, and that, that, there's a sense which intersects with the fake news problem, potentially. Um, troll armies are coming for me in the form of Jamil as uh, uh, telling me that we're, we're, um, we should go to Q&A okay. at this point okay. in the discussion. <laughs> so why don't we open it up to the uh, audience for the last 20 minutes or so, please. Right. Are using people online. So is there a possibility of, you know, would that work? Would that help to some degree? Or, uh, you know, good luck at getting uh, algorithms to be transparent. Oh, you couldn't have asked a question yeah. dearer to my heart. Um, so <laughs> oh, I, uh, Julie, we just uh, repeat the question. Yeah, the question we're... is, should the algorithms be made transparent um, in order to pr provide more accountability? Um, I have spent the past two years doing a series, in addition to the Facebook stuff on algorithmic accountability, trying to reverse engineer algorithms that are out there. And it's a huge amount of work and takes a, you know, two programmers and the researcher and me, four, you know, all four of us a year, year and a half each time. But what I've learned from this process is that um, the way to hold an algorithm accountable is to look at the outcomes and not the formula itself. And I'll give mm -hmm. you an example. We did an analysis that took a year of the a score that is used to get, predict the risk that somebody who's arrested will then go on to commit a future crime in the next two years. So we did a FOIA, we got out the score that was assigned to everybody, 18,000 people in one jurisdiction, and then we compared to the actual outcomes. Did they go on to commit a crime in those next two years? And what we found was this score, big surprise, was biased against black defendants. Um, so when we brought that to the company, uh, they didn't dispute our math, and they said, you know, but look at our algorithm. It's fine, and you can't show it to anyone. So I can't tell you what the algorithm was, but they said it's a trade secret. They sent it over. It's a linear equation, and it is, there's no way you would know looking at that algorithm. It's, you know, they put a little bit of a weight on your year, whether you've been in, arrested before and whether your parents have been arrested. And there's, like, a lot of things. All these inputs are clearly biased, but you wouldn't know that they were particularly biased in the way that we found. And so I strongly believe from doing this type of analysis over and over that transparency to the algorithm is not enough, that you actually have to audit the outcomes. And that's particularly important with things like Facebook, where their newsfeed algorithm, for instance, is really a dynamic, constantly changing thing that doesn't have a, a formula that you could really inspect. And so I believe in auditing inputs and outputs. And that asking for the transparency of the algorithm is like frosting, but it wouldn't be enough. And so I'm worried about people who would push for that alone. Can I just yeah. ask a quick follow-up? 
follow-up question, which is, are there services now providing this audit service to it, you know, to businesses or to people who have concerns about that? I believe there's a lot of academic work going okay. on on auditing algorithms. Um, but I do not know really whether there's a commercial aspect to it. Can I say a word on, on this uh, thing? Um, you know, I have a lot of respect for the people who have spent time on, on this project, including, including you know, I, algorithmic transparency. Um, but I, I share the intuition that without data, you know, an algorithm is by itself only has some meaning. It's, it's the data uh, that, that gives its results. And this data, of course, is, is uh, you know, that is the... The, the gold mine here for all, for all these questions. So just the, and the algorithm also is always cha you know, adapting and changing and really it's a getting at that data that almost seems the more Correct. critical issue. And I, I, at I, least couldn't, to me. I couldn't agree yeah. with you more. Yeah. I mean, that's no, what no. I mean by inputs and outputs. Yeah, maybe data. that's a, a better way. I also sort of reflect, maybe not a good thing to say in a journalism school, but I've become increasingly skeptical about transparency remedies just because I, maybe this is coming us from net neutrality or something. It's, you know, like, so, We've spent 20 years trying to say, oh, you know, for this problem, transparency can solve it, transparency can solve it. I think it's time for some, a little, uh, you know, as a, too often, and maybe this is a DC thing, it's like transparency is what people say when they're not gonna, is a polite way of saying we're gonna do nothing. So, <laughs> well, Tim, yeah, yeah. Tim knows that's, that I've been writing about that and I, I won't bore you with my, yeah. my spiel on that. Oh yeah, but, yeah, um, let's hear about um, But I will, um, I will note that this issue of algorithmic transparency is also coming up with respect to governmental uses of algorithms to guide agency decisions, who gets parole, who gets inspected by the Department of Agriculture. Um, and there are a lot of interesting questions arising about whether government algorithms are subject to request and disclosure under the Freedom of Information Act. Um, uh, I can't help but put in a plug for Jeff Stein, who's a student at the law school writing a brilliant paper on how there, there. certain types of algorithms are so law-like and their effects on regulated entities that they should be subject, he says, to uh, disclosure under the Administrative Procedure okay, Act. Okay, I'm just gonna have to jump in and say, ProPublica and my delightful colleague, Lauren, <laughs> raise your hand, wrote this amazing story about the D um, New York City Crime Lab developed its own algorithm yeah. to analyze DNA. And they were like, cool, we're amazing. Yeah. Nobody can ever see it, but it's gonna be great. And so she wrote a story about all the questions that have been raised that were about it. And we actually joined in a motion to unseal with the Yale Law Clinic, and we have unsealed this is mm -hmm. the first public yeah. algorithm that I know of that's been unsealed in the past three weeks. It's posted on GitHub. We are looking for people to analyze it. So if you're a forensic biologist with a computer science degree, <laughs> um, <laughs> please dig in. But um, we're really proud that we're like, we have actually brought one algorithm to life. Yeah. And the lower courts are split, by the way, on whether algorithms can be requested under freedom of information laws at the state and federal level. So it's an uh, emerging issue. Yeah. I hate to say this, but are we fighting the, the wrong war when we're focusing on algorithms? I mean, the Times Magazine section had this incredible article about how all the advances in machine learning today are coming from neural nets, mm. where the people who've developed the nets yeah. can't even figure out what the decision mechanism yeah. is of the software that they've created. So that uh, in the future, we're gonna have automated decision making where we don't know what the basis is of those decisions. Right, which is why I was arguing that we need to look at auditing outputs. The way to do that is you take a snapshot of all the outputs at a certain time and audit that, right? And that is, so it's not that they're not inspectable entirely, but it's true that the algorithms themselves become this own, they're not inspectable. But what they decide, their decisions are inspectable and we should inspect them. But I, that sort I, of sounds like the way we try to understand judges. <laughs> I'm not kidding, I'm not totally kidding. No, it's that's like, right. You're like, it's impossible to know how they think. But I think it's a yeah. deep question because I think yeah. it, I uh -huh. do think it challenges the whole transparency as accountability paradigm because that paradigm assumes if you just learn, you know, the, the secret memo laying out the policy, you understand the intentions and the likely effects of the policy. Now that a lot of policies developed by algorithms are basically a causal, there's not even a theory about what they're trying to do that, that it will be you know, the, massive correlation. It, yeah, then it's, there's nothing to be revealed in that sense, and that pushes toward an outcome analysis, I think. I saw a hand in the back. This discussion seems to be a lot about American companies and American laws. We'll see it that. Suppose the American government puts things in place, all the laws that you want, and Facebook says, fine, we'll go through and we look at the path. How would you decide? What, if, if they do what? If it, it, the just, question is if, for, if Facebook right. moves. Uh, outside of US jurisdiction because they get a bad legal treatment here. I mean, I guess I would just say that right now, um, the US is the most favorable legal environment and Facebook is quickly trying to get out of Europe, which is heavily regulating them. Yeah. So right now, we are the safe haven. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, it's not inconceivable. These are global companies and they are hard to regulate because of that, right? They, it does argue for an interesting question about whether they're regulatable. No, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a challenge. I think that was a, that was a kind of a big idea in, in the 90s uh, that, you know, internet firms could, could move and avoid regulation. But um, law is uh, fundamentally about physical force and, 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 and actual assets. And, you know, the last 15 years, there's, these, these are giant companies with, with, you know, thousands, tens of hundreds of thousands of employees and a lot of, you know, physical assets. And a company like Facebook can't leave the United States and, and do business in the United States. They just, they just, they, 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 they wouldn't be able to be a, an effective uh, company. Well, they're trying to so build that's, the floating, the yeah. ocean structure. Well, there right? was these companies, I mean, the 90, I, so I wrote a book on this, maybe that's why I'm getting fired up. But, you know, there were these companies, for a while there was this, uh, this uh, little island near the United Kingdom uh, named Sealand, which claims sovereignty. Yeah. It uh, believes it's a, a country. They have a king. They have passports and everything. It's an old oil platform. And so um, uh, a bunch of, uh, they had servers and they, they said, hey, you know, come here. We have no laws. You can be a gambling thing, whatever you want. Uh, but those moves and sort of more effective moves to move to Gibraltar, they haven't been as effective as people would have thought. Uh, one reason is that governments, uh, and I'm going to talk more about law enforcement, one reason is that uh, law enforcement, you know, waits till they come somewhere and arrest the people, and so that's sort of discouraging. You have to live your whole life outside of any civilized country on a little uh, platform or, you know, like WikiLeaks in, in Ecuador or something, so that's, that's a little bit of a downer. Uh, and then also, the, a lot of the enforcement comes through payment networks or something, so, you know, if you try to... Yeah become a gambler right now, you have to sort of go through all these weird moves. You can do it, but you have to go through all these weird moves, wire money overseas, and, and for the average person, like, I'm not going to do it. I mean, it is worth yeah. pointing out that we have the built, not just we, but the world has built the best surveillance ever, right? Like, hiding <laughs> right. is ever more difficult. <laughs> right. Julia's written importantly on that. <laughs> All the, the same U.S. laws. It, I think it, the laws apply in the country in which you operate. So, for instance, right now there is a different version of Facebook you see in Germany. It doesn't have any Nazi propaganda on it, and so they're just. What's happening is that a lot of these services are really just tailoring to each jurisdiction. In Thailand, there are no pictures of the king. Um, that make him look funny because he's not allowed to look funny. And so, you know, they're, they all, all the companies, Google, Twitter, Facebook, do that already. So there are, uh, that's already happening. Are you suggesting they have to do the we, we I'm not suggesting anything. I'm just saying what's happening. This we should probably get a few more um, questions in before we have to, have to wrap. Uh, there were hands over here uh, earlier. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> mm, nice. That's right. Yeah. Maybe summarize what he said so that people can hear. Okay. Yeah. So the question, or the, the actually, it's more of a comment. Is this just this this law, Section 230, is, is very strong in its immunity, because not only does it, um, you know, immunize you for things you don't know about, but even if someone points out to you, like, hey, there's this defamatory speech happening on your forum. Uh, so then you do know about it, uh, you're still immune. It's, I'll, I'll say this is kind of a legal point. It's different than how copyright immunity works, yeah. where it, in copyright law, if you point out to someone they're hosting something infringing and say, take it down, they have to take it down or they yeah. face liability. So it's even stronger, uh, even stronger than that. I would, Can I make a, a, oh, yeah. another thing? There's something I wanted to say earlier in terms of, I don't want to leave the impression I have no solutions to anything. Um, which is, I also think law enforcement needs to make this a priority. I, I, you know, I worked in law enforcement. But what's the this? Yeah. The this. So the problem, we are facing many problems in the American speech environment, one of which is, is the kind of troll armies, and let's focus on that for a second. It, I think, you know, this has a, an enforcement priority of almost zero in, in, among prosecutors yeah. in the United States. But these 
you know, they, they could do something uh, and I, you know, make people think twice about attacking speakers. Uh, many, much of what they do, I think, can be penalized consistent with the, the, the First Amendment. So that's a, a big thing. Uh, I also want to, since we're putting out plugs for random people, uh, the, the New York Attorney General's office um, is starting to get very serious about investigating uh, robot uh, attacks on public commenting systems. So the FCC, mm. uh, my favorite agency, Federal Communications Commission, uh, you know, had, a, had a public comment uh, system open for, for net neutrality comments. So uh, a, f a couple of years ago, uh, there was an overwhelmingly positive uh, pro-net neutrality uh, public comment. So this was, someone saw this as a problem. And so this time around, there have been millions of anti robotic anti net neutrality comments to give the impression that it's very divided, you know, the, the public is, is divided. Um, and so the AG is investigating the corruption of the, of, of the FCC website. And they're actually, so this is the plug, there are uh, many, many identities of real people, New Yorkers, were stolen to, to suggest, and, and comments written in their name, and they're, they're try looking out for people who want to see if their name's looking so, to kill so them. So can I just ask a little what these yeah. laws that you would enforce, are you imagining um, federal identity theft law or state anti-stalking laws? Or what, do, you, uh, both, do you think the I guess, laws are there? Both, yeah, I yeah. Some, uh, there could be better, there could be more. But there are like, fe there was like federal anti-stalking laws, there's um, a violation of unauthorized access laws. There, there's a, you know, if one thing this country has is strong criminal laws, the question is, is enforcement. And this is, has a priority of zero. And I think, you know, people should, make, should be ringing up, you know, ringing up these trolls and, and uh, bringing a lot more indictments. I can't help but note on your, on your point about Section 230 immunity and how you're saying it's perverse. Uh, but Tim noted that the one way you can um, actually get uh, these platforms to be responsive to your concerns about what's on there, what, what's on there is with an allegation of copyright infringement. <laughs> That's um, true. And so you send a copyright notice, and, and there's a notice and takedown procedure, and very quickly they'll take down the content. And so it's uh, benefited copyright holders, particularly big and ones. And this is why I asked when I had my children, I asked many lawyers if I could copyright them well, so is, that I yeah. could get their images taken down, and I was told this, I was not this is, allowed this is, to. This is exactly where I was going with this. There is an in, so law, creative lawyers have figured out, um, if they have a client who's, say, a victim of revenge porn, um, you might think the most obvious remedy is you'd point out to the site, your site is hosting this vile stuff, um, you need to be shut down or take it down. Um, that not being available necessarily under 230 immunity, um, lawyers are saying, said, my client has copyright in the image that you posted on your site. Uh, um, and they said, we'll take, you know, that will be down within 20, 24 hours. Give right um, to it. <laughs> so there's a perverse way in which it's uh, uh, channeled um, opposition to, to the real harms. Um, do we have time, Jamil, for one more question? Okay, anyone want to get the final question in before we? Uh... I have a question. Jamil. All right. Definitely have time. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you both resisted when, when Dave asked uh, what, about the three levels of possible solutions yeah. self regulation, statutory, constitutional. You both, at least initially, resisted the constitutional solution. Uh, and so, I take that to mean that you don't immediately gravitate to the notion that the First Amendment is, is our friend in this context. To, to what extent do you think the First Amendment is a problem? Uh, you know, if Section 230 disappeared, all of these intermediaries would invoke the First Amendment yes. uh, you know, in an attempt to uh, constitutionalize the same immunity that Section 230 now provides. Um, uh, if they were required to disclose their algorithms, inevitably they would invoke the First Amendment uh, in, in defense of uh, right. Secrecy or withholding the algorithm. Um, search engines invoke the First Amendment um, to justify withholding information about how they decide what what sites get prioritized right. in their search results. Uh, so, you know, should we should we be thinking about the First Amendment as not just not a solution but part of the problem? Uh, my answer yes, um, and. It comes from what you've said. So in the new economy, um, almost everything a company does is technically or from some description speech, right? Any, any, anything displayed, any uh, service provided involves, first of all, code and also involves some kind of display or something like that. And if you call all of that protected speech, um, you know, there, there is no law 
there is no power for government to do anything about serious, serious problems. I think it's a serious problem. I, you know, I've run into this a lot, in an, even in antitrust. Uh, well, let me tell an example of one story. So go, one, one interesting example is Google uh, Maps, when it was in beta, um, it's still technically in beta, I think, uh, gave, <laughs> gave uh, directions to someone uh, that were not the best directions because they had them crossing a freeway and, uh, by foot. And they, 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 they followed the directions when we were run over. And so they probably, that was their own fault. But anyway, they sued for tort, uh, you know, sued in tort saying Google was negligent and this sort of thing. Uh, now, look, I don't think it was a good tort suit anyway, but for, Google came back with First Amendment defense and said, listen, yeah. that map is just an opinion as to how to get from A to B. Um, you know, we, we were speaking, and the judge, ignoring all the canons of constitutional avoidance, went right to the constitutional question. So this, this is gone, this, this suit is out of here because they, they're just a speaker giving you, you know, it's like someone on the street corner saying, you know, take the next right and the next left. They can't be uh, held immune at all. So all of tort law is out. Um, you know, that is, I think, a terrible trend. Sometimes called First Amendment Lochnerism. But it's particularly intense in, the, in these environments and I think uh, part of the problem. I think it's going to be really hard for me as a member of the a journalist to really <laughs> trash the First Amendment since it's my only cloak of protection <laughs> in life. Um, but I agree with you that it does not appear to be helping. And I guess I would maybe just, um, I don't know, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't say if it's the flaw of the law itself, but it does feel like it's not the only law that's been corrupted by large companies that have twisted it to their ends, right? And I might just note further that, um, Jamil's question operates against the backdrop of the so-called state action doctrine for those non-lawyers or law students in the room. You know, right now the First Amendment um, has been interpreted not to require much of anything of private companies because as non-state actors, non-governmental actors, they're not covered by its reach. Um, where the First Amendment would apply is if the government tries to force them to do anything. If the government passes a law or a regulation, right. the First Amendment is triggered. Um, and you know, the force of Jamil's question is that um, the First Amendment is not gonna get them to clean up their act at all, uh, and there may be very serious problems that they're uh, contributing to. And uh, if Congress tries to get them to clean up the problems, that's when the First Amendment will, will right. be triggered and potentially block those legislative efforts you know, for, for, for better or worse. Um, that has given rise, I might just note finally, um, to some calls to have the companies themselves be treated as state actors. Um, uh, some people analogize to this famous Supreme Court case, Marsh versus Chambers, where there was a so-called company town, uh, and this company so dominated the life of this town, uh, providing housing and electricity, as well as jobs to the people who worked for the company and lived in this town, um, that the Supreme Court said um, it could be treated like a state actor uh, because it was functioning like a state actor uh, for purposes of constitutional uh, application. And some people said, well, maybe Facebook and you know, it's like that, uh, you know, we're, we're beholden to them in a similar way. Um, maybe just as a final, final question, I'll just uh, right. try to prime you on that, because I know you have been, that, that's, uh, you know, I, I detect that thread in the scholarship emerging. I, right. you know, you heard it here first, you will see articles in the next year uh -huh. or two, you know, proliferating on Facebook as company town, because um, it has this First Amendment significance. To, but you have seemed skeptical of that. Yeah, not into it. Um, in fact, in your edits to my piece, you're like, why don't you keep, you know, <laughs> what about this idea? And then I wrote a paragraph where I said, not into it. This is a terrible idea. I was <laughs> not, and not I think, endorsing I think it. Maybe I'm just being, you know, measuring the algorithm by its out outputs. So, you know, I, I stand for the, the, the theory that these firms need to undertake substantial public responsibilities for our speech environment. I think they, you know, have a power like uh, broadcast media in the 1950s and 60s, like uh, newspapers for, you know, for a very long time, and therefore have to exercise a lot of, a lot of, of judgment and I am in order to create good environments. And I would be terrified by, uh, I think it would be terrible, let's take Wikipedia, which makes a lot of really hard decisions all, all the time and like knocks out entire things, and then we're gonna say, well, they're a state actor, so they have to be neutral. Now maybe you can say, oh, they're now they're speaking. Yeah. But it just creates, and I'm gonna sound like a, I'll, I'll be a, a libertarian. Do we want the unelected federal judiciary 
you know, telling Wikipedia when it, and, you know, adjudicating every Wikipedia dispute, it seems to me a, a terrible idea, and I just think it would make things worse rather than better. I just think on a final note, though, I would just say yeah. we will have an opportunity to examine that because Facebook is actually building an actual company town on their campus <laughs> with housing, <laughs> schools, and parks, and so we're not too far from the actual. <laughs> That's Inter right. interesting. I didn't, Thank know you. I didn't know that either. Um, I'll, I'll just close by ending and light, a plug for Knight. You know, Knight is bringing a lawsuit right now um, arguing that, at least for the limited purpose of President Donald Trump's um, blocking of critics on Twitter, um, we can think of that um, use of Twitter in, in a, as a kind of governmental or quasi-governmental forum for purposes of First Amendment analysis. I don't think it has to be an all or nothing, in other words. Right. I share your skepticism about <coughs> assuming Facebook, you know, right. top to bottom is a state actor, but there might be more intermediate solutions. Um, I want to thank Julie and Tim for a great discussion, and uh, Knight and Brown for hosting us, and I hope people stick around. Thank you. Great. I learned a lot from your. I learned a lot from your.